Are you ready for some excitement? So, yeah, um, egg. Fluffering sucker sash. A egg. Egg is apparently Dave Stewart's thing before Neil's Heavy Concept album, before his work with Barbara Gaskin, before Bruford, before National Health, before Fish Rising, before Hatfield of the North, before Con, all the way back to 1970. If any of you have been following this series from the beginning, you know we've dabbled a lot in Canterbury groups. This is one of the earliest ones. The founding members of Egg included Mont Campbell on bass and vocals, Dave Stewart on organ, and Clive Brooks on drums. Actually, Egg grew out of a group called Uriel. Included the same lineup, except they had a guitar player by the name of Steve Hillage. He left in the summer of 1968 to go to college. Prior to Hillage leaving, they were merely a cover band. Once he left, uh, they decided to go in a more original direction. They signed a deal with Middle Earth Club's management branch, and at that time, they were advised by the management to change their name to something other than Uriel because it sounded too much like urinal. So they chose Egg. So let me see if I can apply what I've learned so far this season. I know from the four other albums that feature Dave Stewart that I can expect top-notch keyboard work and Chick Corea levels of improvisational creativity. Going by Soft Machine and Amandul 2, I think it's reasonable to assume that venturing all the way back to 1970, we won't be all the way into full progressive rock ornateness. And there's likely to be a pretty strong psychedelic influence. Anything else? I think the fact that they chose the name Egg for both the band name and the album name can mean one of two things. Either they're using the concept of the egg as a symbolic representation of the creative impulse, as it represents a life created that has the potential to outlive its creator while simultaneously implying that nothing created can ever be completely known by its creator, since a necessary opacity in the form of the creator's own unexamined mental tendencies must accompany the creation itself. Therefore, what emerges can be as much a surprise to the artist as it is to those who encounter the final work. And if we go by this assumption, then the music is likely to be trippy and perhaps heavy on the omphaloskepsis. Or perhaps ovoskepsis. My, but we're feeling wordy today, aren't we? The other option is just that they think egg is a funny word. Meaning that the music will have more of that good old Canterbury whimsy. Looking at the song titles, could go either way. Well, I haven't had a bad time with Dave Stewart yet. So, bring on egg! In mid-1969, they signed a deal with Decca Records, released their debut album the following year. It wasn't exactly a commercial success, but it did well enough that they were allowed to make another album after that. Although at first it was shelved and did not get released until mid-1971. But despite accumulating enough material for a third album, they were unable to secure a record deal and the band split up in July of 1972. In 1974, Stewart, who had signed with Virgin as a member of Hatfield in the North, got a deal for Egg to record their third album of unreleased material. In December of 2007, some live recordings were released under the title The Metronomical Society. Okay, so not so much a psychedelic influence, more an acid rock thing. Tomato, tomato. I guess that given the keyboard-led nature of the band, I was expecting Egg to be more along the lines of the instrumental stretches from the early Floyd albums, or maybe the United States of America. <laughs> They were greatly inspired by Keith Emerson and the Nice at the time, and also classical music that they'd all grown up on. But instead, what I think I'm hearing is more closely aligned with Procol Harum, or maybe early Deep Purple, only replaced the guitars with a sense of humor. <laughs> well, that and a good deal more complexity in the compositions. If Odd Meter makes you uncomfortable, Egg is not for you. Their use of Odd Meters was quite prevalent, even to the point of having a single called Seven is a Jolly Good Time. I started writing songs in all the rhythms I could find, like five. Which also became the name of a best of. And believe it or not, I actually think that the complexity begins right away with the opening ninth second piece, Bulb. The song consists of a single event, the sound of glass shattering. 
only with heavy delay and reverb. But since the song is called Bulb, then the obvious inference is the breaking of a light bulb. And the image of a breaking light bulb on an album called Egg by a band called Egg cannot help but be anything but an aural A U R A L. Aural metaphor for a hatching egg. And because the event is repeated via tape echo, it can then be seen to represent a single action that has birthed numerous creations. So this little nine-second sound effect can also be seen as the band's thesis statement. Geez, you really did eat your alpha bits this morning, didn't you? What's great about the intro to While Growing My Hair is that the bass and drum hits against the organ arpeggios are phrased such they don't precisely land in time. The last note is rushed each time. And that's harder to pull off than you might think. And once the verse starts. Well, I don't hate Mont Campbell's voice. It's a perfectly nice voice. With all the notes in tune, decent vibrato, I just don't feel like it fits with the rest of the instrumentation. Not exactly an accordion on top of heavy metal, but that points to what I'm trying to say. Everything else on that opening track is great though even though I couldn't help but notice an absence of any kind of improvisation. The thing I love most about I Will Be Absorbed is akin to what I liked about while growing my hair. The fact that the instrumentation and the vocals don't line up completely on the rubato chorus sections. Again, damn difficult to pull off. I also think that Campbell's voice is better suited to this song. Also, also, still no improvisation at all. Are you sure this counts as a Canterbury recording? Fugue in D minor. Please consult track three of Jethro Tull's album, Stand Up, for further information. And then a sober and emotive solo piano piece called They Laughed When I Sat Down at the Piano. Ellipses. <laughs> well, not entirely solo. More a duet for piano and severely ill tone generator. <laughs> like you do. Next, the Song of McGillicuddy, the Pusillanimous, open parentheses, or don't worry, James, comma, your socks are hanging in the coal cellar with Thomas, close parentheses. As with any great Canterbury, there is a strong element of humor in their music, often in the titles as well, which is quite obvious here. Really fast, energetic, 5'8", cooks, great organ sound, great bass sound, fabulous groove, Campbell's voice is also there. And about a minute and a half in, we get our first and only improvised Dave Stewart keyboard solo on the entire side. It actually sounds like we get all the solos for the first side piled on top of each other. It's the one passage of the album I don't think they could have performed live. Unless Dave has two extra arms I don't know about. Then they bring it all the way down, and Mont Campbell solos a bit, and that's fabulous as well. And to end the side, Boilk. Boilk? Boilk. Which is an odd little minute-long bit of electronic silliness. Spiffy. And finally, the 24-minute full-side song titled Symphony Number no. 2, consisting of Movement 1, Movement 2, Blaine, and Movement 4. Ooh, 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 I think I found the epic. Mont Campbell was the main composer for this particular group, and he acknowledged a strong influence from Igor Stravinsky, which inspired the multi-part suite Symphony No. 2. And also, another one on the next album called Long Peace. Both albums had sidelong epics on them, and then shorter songs on the rest of the albums. For a couple of minutes, we're in the same rhythmically and structurally complex space we've been in for most of side one, only this time in nine, groups of five and four. But then Dave Stewart gets a chance to stretch out, first on a comfortable mid-tempo groove, then slowed way down. This sounds like the kind of thing I thought I'd be hearing on the entire album. Back to the figure in nine for a bit, and then stop. And that's the end of the first movement, I think. Second movement is largely a slow five with lots of improv for bass and drums. This kind of segues into some improvisation by Dave Stewart on the tone generator, which is not something that happens very often. 
It's basically just one knob and you twist it. <laughs> Another stop and we're into some heavy duty electronic noise. I'm guessing that this bit is Blaine. I'm not sure what's actually happening instrument wise here. It sounds a whole lot like a clavinet run through a string of effects, like low pass filter, ring modulator, tape delay, and reverb. Since there's no clavinet on the credits, I suppose he did it all on an organ. Maybe patching the effects in at the mixing desk? Not sure. Either way, menacing, especially when you hear that voice in the back that's repeating, stop that, stop that. Final movement is largely bass and drum fills in seven with a very catchy melody, beginning and ending of each. So far I'd say this is a good album, but it's not blowing my tiny little mind the way some of Dave Stewart's other works have. There are some standout moments though, to be sure. Incredible even. The incredible edible egg. Although I started out liking it pretty well the first time around, Egg really ended up growing on me all through the week. You're sure that's how you want to word that? And that includes Mont Campbell's voice. It seemed to fit better over time, like a loungier doors maybe. Looking back at my first responses to Egg, I think there were two initial barriers for me. The first is that my ear is now so accustomed to music and adventurous time signatures that Egg's use of bars of five, seven, nine, and even 13 all felt pretty normal. But in 1970, it very much wasn't. But the other barrier was one of timelines. Just a bit of behind the scenes. When Sean and I selected the albums, I intentionally allowed Random Chance to select the order. We set the albums out on my back steps for a picture, then I gathered them into a pile, and that was the order. The only adjustment I made was that I put the three Bowie albums on the Thanksgiving week to give me a little more time. I now think that if I had heard Egg before I'd heard Hatfield in the North and before National Health, I would have had a deeper appreciation for it. Those two albums set my expectations pretty high. But now that I've had a chance to spend a week with Egg, well, here's what I hear now when I spin the album. Mostly I hear really nice grooves, especially in I Will Be Absorbed, Fugue in D Minor, and the later bits of Side 2. Intelligent. Lovely. Clever. The song of McGillicuddy, the pusillanimous, parentheses, or don't worry, James, comma, your socks are hanging in the coal cellar with Thomas, close parentheses, still my favorite tune on the album. I do love the energy on that one. I'm impressed with the range of sounds Dave Stewart was able to get out of just piano and organ. No synth on this one. No electric piano, no clavinet. Just organ, piano, and one tone generator. If you enjoyed this debut from Egg, don't stop there. Crack open their 1971 album, The Polite Force, next. And if that isn't enough for you, venture into their 1974 release, The Civil Surface. Impressive.